Hello, my name's Eleanor and I'm the Education Manager at Benjamin Franklin House. Welcome to the first in our series of uh, virtual family days that we're going to be running every Tuesday throughout August. Um, these are going to be a bit like the science classes that we were doing throughout the summer term. Um, but they and they are going to be quite science focused, but we're also going to do some history ones too. Um, so we'll start off with a bit of a presentation, thinking about the history um, and the science, and then I'll show you either a an experiment, demonstration, or a craft activity to complete at home. So we're really delighted that we're able to be back in Benjamin Franklin House and we've started opening to the public as well. Um, and so you'll see the 18th century panelling behind me. Um, and so for these family days, as I said, we're running them every Tuesday in August. We're going to have an in-person element for a small number of families that, that would like to, to come and see us in person. So that's um, going to be from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. in the morning. And then um, so that everyone is able to access access the, the family days we're also going to do this virtual element so those are going to be at, at 3 p.m in the afternoon and they're going to be just just half an hour because we'll, we'll go through all the, all the history and the science and then I'll show you how to do the activity but then you'll 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 complete that um, afterwards at home so I think I recognize the names of the the attendees today so I think you maybe joined us for virtual classes before but I'll just run through um, a recap of, of how you can engage with us this afternoon we're really looking forward to having your questions and comments and feedback so when you're watching live there are two main ways that you can you can participate so one of those is to use your raise hand button so if you click your mouse or tap your screen you should see some icons come up and the one with the hand if you press that then I can unmute your microphone and you can ask your question um, over, over the microphone, over the audio. And then another way you can participate is by using the Q&A button. So again, if you tap your screen or click your mouse and you get the icons, there's a button that has kind of two speech bubbles. And if you press that, then you can type your question and I can answer it. And people also like to um, participate just by typing into the comments too. So that, that works as well. And we are recording today's lesson. So if you're watching this later on YouTube or on our website, then you can always leave questions or comments in the comments. Um, and also you can always send um, questions or feedback to me by email by sending an email to education at benjaminfranklinhouse.org. So um, on to today's session. So it's called Up, Up and Away. And today we're going to be thinking about Benjamin Franklin and flight. Now, um, those of you that have joined us for some of the science classes we're running and all the recordings are on, um, there are links to them on the education page of our website. So you can always check out any ones you missed. Um, we'll know that Ben Franklin was really interested in forces and we did a few different sessions about different types of forces. So that's going to be the, the main science link with our session today as well. So um, remember Ben Franklin was born over 300 years ago in 1706 so at that time there weren't any planes yet. Um, I wonder if anyone knows when, when the first plane was invented or maybe who, who it was who invented it. Okay, so um, remember, do feel free if you'd like to raise your hand or use the Q&A or, or the comments. Um, so it was actually the Wright brothers, um, and that was in 1903, so over, over 100 years after, after Benjamin Franklin passed away. However, although there weren't planes, there were things that could fly, and um, one of these was, was a kite. Uh, and we can see Ben Franklin with a kite in the image on the screen, and um, he's very associated with kites. I wonder if, if anyone joining knows um, why he's so, he's so connected with kites, and maybe even what, what's being represented in this picture. It's something that we've spoken about in previous classes. Probably his most famous science experiment. I can see in the chat that um, from Dario we have kite and key. Exactly, that's that's what he's most um, known for with the kites, and that's what we can see in this picture. So um, when Ben Franklin was still living in Philadelphia before he came to live in Craven Street in London, which is where 
we call Benjamin Franklin House today. And you can see the little drawing of the house on the screen. Um, when he was living in Philadelphia, he was trying to show that lightning was a natural form of electricity. And to do that, he took his kites out into the storm and the electricity got conducted down to his key at the end. So he wrote all about this and it was very famous and um, was one of the reasons he became such a well-known and influential scientist. Thank you so much for, for that answer. So, um, but way before he did the kite and key experiment, so this, this happened in 1752, about five years before he came to London, he'd already started using kites um, when, he was, when he was a really young, a young boy really. So on the next um, slide, I'm going to show you another image. So here we have Ben Franklin and in his autobiography, which he wrote the story of his life in, he wrote about how when he was a young boy, he loved swimming. I mean, he loved exercise in general, but he was born in Boston, although he later lived in Philadelphia. Um, and there was lots of water around that city, so he could do lots of swimming. And he was interested in trying to find ways to swim more quickly. So in a previous, uh, in a, one of our virtual science classes, we um, looked at swim fins, because he invented a kind of early type of swim fins to help him swim more quickly. And he also experimented with using a kite to pull him across the water. So a bit like how people do, do kite surfing today. So we really do associate Ben Franklin with, with kites and it's very well known. Less people know about this association with the kite from when he was a young boy and was experimenting with ways to, to swim more quickly. Um, but there's another type of flying device that we also associate with Ben Franklin um, and that was the hot air balloon. So although he didn't live long enough to see um, the first plane flight and in fact Ben Franklin he almost uh, had a premonition of this because he said he said he thought he'd been born a hundred years too soon. Um, he did witness the first manned and untethered, so not connected to the ground with ropes, hot air balloon flights. Now I wonder if anyone knows anything about that first hot air balloon, maybe who who invented it or where it was flown for the first time, what country it was in. So it was actually two, two brothers again called the Montgolfier brothers and so they were in France and here we have um, on the left a picture of Ben Franklin in France which I'll talk about in a moment and on the right a picture of this first um, flight or ascent of, of a hot air balloon. So um, they were the Montgolfier brothers and they um, were actually the sons of someone who owned a paper factory. So their very earliest um, experiments with with the idea of a hot air balloon, they were using paper and paper bags, and they realized that if you um, if you put hot air into the paper, it would rise. Now, does anyone know why that happens? Why that the once there's hot air in a balloon or in paper, it will it will rise up. So another important part of science knowledge. So when um, air gets heated, it becomes less dense. And when it's less dense, it, it rises above the other air. So by heating the air inside the balloon, they could make it rise up. And um, the picture you can see on the screen, this is the very first demonstration they did. So it was in June of 1783. And um, in, the, in Annonay, which is where the brothers were from, which is in the south of France, and um, it caused a, a big stir. Everyone was really excited about this demonstration. So they ended up repeating it. They traveled around France and they wanted to show the king. So they went to Paris. And um, so later that year in November, they did another demonstration and this was the one Benjamin Franklin saw and this time not only did the air balloon um, the hot air balloon rise into the air but it um, had had drivers it had um, two men called uh, Pilatre and Rosier um, who, who were in it um, and it, it was released from the tethers so the ropes that were keeping it attached to the ground so again, everyone was very excited about this and Benjamin Franklin wrote about having seen it um, in his letters. He was always writing letters to his friends, often about things to do with science and discoveries he'd made. So he was very lucky to get to witness this um, first manned, untethered flight of the hot air balloon. And I mentioned it was invented by the Montgolfier brothers. And in fact, in French, that's, that is the word for hot air balloon, a Montgolfier. 
So um, as I said, on, on the left of the screen, we have a picture of Benjamin Franklin in, in Paris. In fact, he's at, he's at the court um, in Versailles and on the, on the sofa, there's Marie Antoinette and, and King Louis. Uh, I wonder if anyone, anyone tuning in live knows why Benjamin Franklin was in Paris, what made him go there? So it was after his time in London, he ended up going to Paris. I wonder if anyone knows what took him there, apart from all this interest in science. Okay, fantastic. So from Dari again, I can see um, you've written Independence War and you're, you're quite right. So, I mean, that was um, when Benjamin Franklin was in London. Again, he was doing lots of science, but he was mostly there for um, he was mostly there for a political reason. So he was trying to um, keep uh, England and America on good terms. But by the time he left in 1775, it had become clear that, that they weren't going to be able to stay um, as one one country. So um, that's when they had the War of Independence or the Revolutionary War and America broke away and became its own independent country. So when Benjamin Franklin left London, he briefly went back to America and then was quickly sent to Paris as the first American ambassador to France. And he did a very good job of convincing the French that they should support the Americans in the war. And that had a really important impact on, on the final result, which was that the Americans were able to win and um, have their independence. So that's what really took him to Paris. And he was there for quite a long time. So at the top of the screen, you can see the date. So he was there from 1776 to 1785, so about nine years. Um, so not as long as he'd been in London, because he was um, at Craven Street for 16 years, but still a, a very long time. And he got to do lots of exciting things while, while he was there. OK, so we've talked a bit about the, the different flying devices that Ben Franklin's associated with. And now we're going to kind of link that back to our science and think about um, how that links to forces. Um, so we've talked about forces in, in previous sessions. Does anyone think they could um, explain what forces are? What's a very simple way of explaining um, what forces are, or what they do? So a simple way of explaining forces is that we can call them um, pushes and pulls. Um, now, actually, when it comes to flying, there's often lots of forces at play. So let's have a little look at those, um, some of the flying um, apparatus that we've looked at already. So on the left, you can see the kite. Now, there are lots of forces at play with the kite. So you've got um, lift which is um, the kind of wind that is, that is helping it, it move up. I can see I've got a, a raised hand, so that might be a question or, or a comment. So let me see if I can unmute your microphone. Hello? Okay, so if you unmute your microphone, then you should be able to ask your question or add your comment. Oh, okay, it was a mistake, no worries. Okay. So, there we go. Um, right, so yes, so with a kite you have lift, which is kind of the air that's pushing it up. Um, you also have drag, so that's to do with the fact that you get air resistance from the material um, and it's pushing against that. Um, that, that lift. Then you have tension, that's what's happening in the string. Um, and you also have gravity, which is the force that's pulling it down to earth and pulling all of us down to earth while we're not all flying around um, in the air. So lots of different forces at play. And um, there's even more forces going on with the hot air balloon. So you can see in the diagram in the middle of the screen um, there's that they're listed there. So once again, we have we have gravity and air resistance. Also, the wind is having an impact. Now, the one um, with the arrow going up, it says buoyancy. So that's to do with um, with that hot air that I mentioned. So because there's a flame um, in the basket of the of the hot air balloon that's um, heating the air that's going into the balloon. Remember that makes the air less dense, so it's giving it buoyancy. So buoyancy is like when things can float. So thinking about things that happen in water as well. 
Now for our activity today, because with kites and hot air balloons, there's a, a lot of forces going on. I thought we'd look at a slightly simpler kind of flying or actually descending device, which is a parachute. So you can see that on the right hand side of your screen. And there's two main forces at play with, with the parachute. So you've got the gravity pulling you down to the ground and then the air resistance of the parachute. And that's how parachutes can keep you safe if you were to fall out uh, of a plane. Um, if, you, if you didn't have a parachute, the you would, it would really, you would, there'd be some air resistance from, from your body, but really not enough to, to keep you safe because the gravity would be, would be pulling you down so quickly that um, you, would, you would fall in a dangerous way. But that's why parachutes are so useful. The, the surface area, the size of the material of the parachute um, gives that enough air resistance so that the forces can balance and you can, you can fall slowly down, down to earth. So I'm going to um, stop sharing my presentation now and I'm going to show you how to um, do a fun um, experiment or investigation using parachutes. Before I do that though, does anyone have any questions on what we've done so far? Okay, well if you have any questions at any point, do, do just let me know. So I'm going to slightly move my camera so you can see everything we're going to be using today. Right, so um, we're going to do a really, um, we want to do a, a very fair experiment, so we're talking a bit about how we make sure we do that, um, and we're going to be making some parachutes. So here's one I made earlier, and I've got a little model Ben inside my parachute, um, but you could use a, a Lego figurine or a toy soldier, or even you could make one out of um, Play-Doh. So it's quite flexible what you use in your, in your parachute, um, but you wanna make sure you use the same one for each test, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. So before we talk about how we're gonna do the, um, the experiment or the investigation, I'm just gonna show you how you actually make the, um, the parachute. So it's really simple. Let me tell you what you need. Um, so you're going to need, for the parachute itself, um, a plastic bag. Uh, you could use a, a bin bag, especially if you want to do some really big parachutes, that might be good to have, um, have more plastic to use. If you don't have any plastic bags, if you've been doing lots of good recycling, then you, you can use paper as well. Um, so you have your plastic bag. Um, now I use a little, um, it's one of the segments from, from um, an egg box, uh, just to be able to put my, um, well, my Franklin puppet or whatever figurine you're using in, but you could use something else recyclable, so something like a small yogurt pot would work as well. Um, so you need that too. You need some string, a sharp pencil, some scissors, and a ruler or a tape measure. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is make the, um, the material for your parachute. So I'm gonna take my plastic bag. Now, the one that I made earlier, that was um, each side was 10 centimeters. So we're gonna be, um, for our experiment, we're gonna be thinking about how the size of the parachute is gonna affect the time it takes you to fall. Um, so I've done one with 10 centimeters. So for this one, I'm gonna make it 20 centimeters. So I'm taking my ruler and uh, on my plastic bag, I'm going to draw out 20 centimeters in a square. So you, may, you could use your pencil or it might be easier to use a pen. So if I draw 20 centimeters in a square, now thinking about that fair test, we do wanna make sure they're all the same shape. So we're gonna be doing squares. Okay, so I've drawn out the outline of my parachute. And now I'm gonna cut it out. So do be careful as you're cutting it out because remember to make sure we're doing a really fair test we're going to want to make sure we really keep to those measurements that we did
Okay. So I've got the material for my parachute now. Um, the next thing I want to do is make a little hole in each of the four corners. And I'm going to do that with my sharp pencil. So be careful when you do this um, to watch your fingers on the other side, but just in the corner, you just poke a hole through. And then you're going to be able to put your string through that. So I won't do all four corners just, just now, um, but just to show you how you do it. So that's what you're going to do for your parachute. And then you're going to take your um, part of your egg box, or you may have used the yogurt pot or something else. And you're going to do the same by poking the holes through. So you're going to want four holes. So again, watching out for your fingers, you're going to take your sharp pencil and poke it through. And if you need to make the hole a bit bigger to fit your string through, if you just twist your pencil back and forth, that should make it um, the right size for you. So with your string, again, when we come to talk about our test, we're gonna be thinking about how we make it fair. And one of the ways we do that is making sure that all of our um, pieces of string are the same length. So I measured these before and they're all 30 centimeters. So then, when I'd made all those holes, I'm just going to use, use the one example to show you now. I would um, thread my string through the hole on the kind of basket, and then I'm going to um, tie a double knot so that it doesn't come back through the hole. And then I'm going to tie the other end through the hole in my parachute. So again, I'm going to do a double knot to make sure it doesn't come back through. Okay. So that's what you're going to need to do for um, all, all four corners of the parachute and make sure you've got the four holes on your, um, your basket at the bottom as well. And then you'll have your parachute done. Um, and once you've made your one, your one parachute, um, you're going to be changing the size of the actual material. So in this case, plastic bag, or you might be using paper. Um, and it would to make it really fair test, it's best if you keep the same um, kind of basket and pieces of string, uh, and you just change the, the material as they get bigger, okay? So that's how you make it. And then you put your, your figurine inside, whether it's a, a mini Franklin or, or something else, and you might need to use some blue tack to secure it in there as well. That's what I've done with mine. Okay, so that's how you make the parachute. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, great. So now we can talk about how we're gonna do the actual experiment. So um, what we're investigating is whether the size of the um, parachute, so the actual material, um, affects how long it takes for it to fall. So um, we're thinking about the surface area. So remember to find that you, you multiply the lengths of the sides by each other. So remember this was 10 by 10. So 10 times 10 is 100. So my first surface area is 100 centimeters squared. And then the one I just made um, is 20 by 20. So that surface area is gonna be 400 centimeters squared. And then I can keep growing it as I, um, as I carry on my experiment. So as we're going to have bigger parachutes, um, so we're trying to think about how that will affect the length of the time it takes the parachute, the parachute to fall. So before we do our experiment, uh, it's a good idea to have, try to have a go at making a prediction. So does anyone think they have a prediction of, of what's going to happen as we increase the size of the material on the parachute? Do you think that will make um, it take longer for Franklin to fall or, or shorter time for him to fall? So I've got a comment from Yasin. Okay, so Yasin thinks that it will take longer for the parachute to fall when, um, when it's got a bigger surface area. Okay, it'll be interesting to know um, if other people agree or not. So, um, so you made your prediction and then, as I said, we want to make sure it's a fair test. So we want to be thinking about what, how we make tests fair. So to, to have a fair test, we really want to make sure there's only one variable. So one thing we're changing. And in this case, the thing we're changing is the size of the material on the parachute. 
So everything else you want to keep the same. So that's why I've asked you to try and make sure you have the same figurine um, and the same basket and pieces of string. And you want the lengths of the pieces of string to be the same size. So that's what we're doing to make sure it's fair. When it comes to dropping the parachute, we're also going to want to make sure that it, we're doing it from the same height. So that's why I've got this big tape measure here. So it measures up to 1.5 meters. And I'm going to make sure when I'm dropping the parachutes that I always drop it with the bottom of the basket right at the edge of the um, tape measure. So that's making sure it's fair as well. Um, so you see I've got a table here, so um, that's also thinking about how I'm going to record my results. So a table is, an, is a nice clear way and after doing a table you might want to think of other ways you could show the results to make it even clearer. So maybe some kind of graph to make it really visual about the relationship between the surface area of the material and how long it takes the parachute to fall. So um, the things we're measuring are the surface area, so we've been doing that when we're doing our making, and then um, fall time. So um, how and in what unit am I going to be measuring the fall time, do you think? Has anyone got an idea of, of how I'll be doing that? I'm going to use some technology to help me. So thinking about time and what unit we might use. Okay, so Daria said camera. So you're, you're on the right track. It's something that does, it's a device that does have a camera. Ah, and then stopwatch. Exactly, a stopwatch. So um, there's a few different ways you could time this. You, um, you can use a stopwatch. I'm going to use one on a tablet, um, but you can use one on a phone, or you can even use the second hand on a watch. So there's different ways you could time it. And my unit of measure is going to be seconds. Okay, so that's what I'm going to be timing. So it's going to be quite quick, especially at the beginning, because poor old Ben, he hasn't got a lot of parachute. So um, I think he's going to be falling quite quickly. So I'll just show you the, my first one. And hopefully after that, you'll have seen um, how you would continue with the experiment at home. And I'll see if anyone's got any questions. Okay, so I'm going to get my, um, my stopwatch ready. Now, if you are doing this with someone else at home, that can be really helpful because then one person can um, do the stopwatch, the timing, and someone else can really concentrate on, on dropping the parachutes. And then you can even have another person who's recording what's happening, and then you could try swapping around roles so that you're working together. Okay, so I've got my timer on zero. And when I drop it, I'm going to press start. And then when he falls, when I hear him hit the floor, I'm going to press stop. Okay, so one, two, three. Wow, okay, so my um, stopwatch, I'm not sure if you can see, says 0 0.95 seconds. So I'm going to write that into my table as my result. Now, if we're being really scientific, um, what, what might I do next with the same size parachute before I move on to the next size? What could I do to be even more certain of my result and make sure I haven't got an anomaly, so a result that wasn't expecting? What do you think I could do to make, um, to make my results even more reliable? Okay, I can see Yasin said try again. Exactly. So um, sometimes it's a good idea to try each one three times and then you can come up with an average length of uh, length of time it takes for um, Franklin to fall with that size parachute. So that's how you, uh, you can do the parachute investigation at home. Um, I am going to be uploading the recording of this class to, um, to our website, to the event page later today, and also a shorter video just of how to make the, the parachute. So if I went a bit too quickly for you, you can, you can re-watch it on there. Um, but that is the end of our class for today. Does anyone have any questions about things that we've learned about or about how to do the in, um, investigation at home? Okay, I can't see any questions coming up now, but remember you can always get in touch with me by sending an email to education at benjaminfranklinhouse.com.
www.ghostbusiness.org. Oh, thank you, uh, Yasin. That's lovely to hear you saying thank you. And um, next week at the same time um, virtually, and if anyone is interested in coming to the house in person earlier in the day, um, we are going to be doing a session called Houston School of Anatomy. So we're going to be learning about another scientist who lived at 36 Craven Street. Thank you also, Daria. Um, and um, we're gonna be learning about his anatomy school and so looking at the human body. So more science next week, but our activity is going to be a craft activity, but with a bit of a science twist. So thank you again so much for joining and hope to see you next week. Goodbye. Bye.